I'm struck by much of what I have to say has been said already. That won't stop me from using all the time. I really enjoyed the previous two presentations, but it gives me a platform to build from. So what I'm interested in here is that I think there's been a huge shift from roughly 1900 until about now in science and this has already been alluded to by uh, Jean in particular, but by both. Uh, in 1899, we viewed <clears throat> parts of the world that were open to science as being highly ordered. The sciences themselves were very formalistic, built out of axioms, things like that. We viewed the parts of the world we could look at uh, scientifically as being highly determinate. The logic we brought to bear was deductive, and the world was in some sort of stasis or harmony or some kind of equilibrium. I wouldn't say that's exactly true, and you could probably niggle. And by the way, when I say 1900, I want to be a little bit more precise. It was <clears throat> things changed um, on the uh, week before 1900, and that's uh, between Christmas 1899 and the turn of the century. That's when Max Planck sat down and theorized the quantum that particular week. Um, and things have changed, I think, <clears throat> roughly speaking, from order to organicism, whatever that means. Uh, formalism, we now think of things being highly contingent. These are the previous two talks. Uh, we've gone in a lot of the world we think about now as being indeterminate, open to process, and the word open keeps coming up. Uh, that was the missing word that was not revealed by Jean, that Prigogine, you know, uh, the world is open. And, <laughs> oh, this is so camera side. Um, anyway, uh, openness. So our view of what science is all about, it's not so much what the world is all about, but science is all about, has shifted. And that's what I want to ask, why? In particular, within about 40 years of Newton's Principia, uh, in the height of the Enlightenment, people began to think that the world that you could look at with reason or rationality or scientifically was orderly, it was mechanistic. Mechanistic goes back beyond Newton, by the way, to about the 1620s in France, and was heavily pushed by the Catholic Church because they didn't want demons and things. And uh, the world, uh, science was predictable, or some system was um, scientific, it should be predictable. And as I said, it was in some form of stasis or equilibrium. So these have come to be the hallmarks, at least up until 1900 or so, of how we think of science. And things like predictability live on to the present. So my real question is, how did we get from looking at the scientific world as ordered in this way, mechanistically a beautiful machine taking over in equilibrium, we could adjust here and there, and as Jean kept saying, it wobbles a bit. It's uh, like a spider's web, but it's highly mechanistic and very ordered. To here, we'd be comfortable with this sort of system. Uh, nowadays, <clears throat> that's a block of ice that was cut out of a river in Northwest America, Washington State, I think. And what you're looking at here is the fracture planes in this block of ice. We would now be able to say we can understand how some pattern like this forms, but how we get to that sort of understanding, for me, illustrates how science has changed a lot. That's path dependent, I would guess, where the first cracks form determine where the following cracks form. Is certainly not predictable in advance. It looks complicated. I wouldn't say it's the same as being complex, but the patterns that form originally determine where the next fractures are going to be. And so we are comfortable with this now, where we weren't 
a century or 120 years ago. My question then is how do you get, what are the pathways that have taken us from this view of the world to this one? And I want to keep emphasizing that <clears throat> parts of the world are indeed in equilibrium and indeed predictable, etc. The planets are going around and ellipse as much as Newton and Kepler thought. Uh, so I'm, I'm not ruling that out. I'm just saying layered on top, I think, is a much more sophisticated understanding. Where did it come from? Well, this is not particularly uh, the only pathway, but one major one is that in every subject I know about, <clears throat> mathematics, physics, um, philosophy, even economics, uh, when we think we have some concept that's highly ordered and very pure, and we question it deeply, it tends to shatter, it tends to fall apart. The whole idea that you could axiomatize mathematics, <clears throat> Gödel took a very good hard look at that in the early 1930s, and basically said, okay, cook up any axiomatic system, I will show you truths or statements in arithmetic that cannot be proved true or false, either within that axiomatic <coughs> system. Similarly, Turing, a few years later, in fact, they both knew each other at Princeton. Um, Alan Turing, 1936, <coughs> asks this question, is there a magic machine? Is there a wonderful method? Is there a beautiful algorithm? that we could feed some statement from mathematics into, turn the crank, and it spits out, this statement is true, or the statement is false. In other words, could we decide the truth or falsity of a given statement in mathematics? And he showed there can be no such machine. So I have looked at many of these sorts of things. In fact, I find I'm fascinated by this. And the conclusion I come to is that if you push hard enough on any pure concept, truth, beauty, uh, atomic structure, or there structures that cannot be cleaved, a tom, not cuttable, these always fall apart when you shine a highly focused and very intelligent light on them. So we've lost our innocence. We can't say the world works this way. In fact, if we went back to 1733 and talked to the Enlightenment people, and it's, oh yes, it's, everything is governed by reason and intellect and so on. Well, so well, what sort of reason are they be giving us these concepts of predictability and harmony? And they say, oh, hang on. It's like the common mark just made, you know. What about structure? We are so much more advanced in our insights. I'm not trying to be self-congratulatory. I'm just saying we are more nuanced is probably a better word. Second thing is that biology, well, it existed in the time of Cuvier, uh, but 20th century, bi 20th century biology, certainly from about 1953 on, is a huge embarrassment to these principles of the Enlightenment. Um, here they are again, but if you take speciation, which is what Darwin had thought about most, uh, take embryology, how um, biological organisms form, protein expression, we heard a bit about that, uh, neural systems, uh, genetic regulatory <coughs> networks. You take any of these systems, structures, whatever you want to call them, organic systems, and you look at them and you find that, well, yeah, they're pretty much ordered, but hang on, they're open. The, certainly this the system of species is open, keeps giving us new species. And this is not something 19th century scientists would have been very comfortable with. 
of course, Darwin pointed this out in the 19th century. Such systems are mechanistic. We know how neurons fire. We know how um, we know how synapses work. We know all these details. So in that sense, we know the me me mechanisms. But it's also pattern-based. I use that. I'm not sure the word organic is perfect here, but it's, it's very pattern-based in a way you've just heard about. Such systems are not generally predictable unless you know everything, unless the systems are closed, and these systems are, are generally not. And they're not really in stasis. There's nothing about this collection of species we have now that's in stasis. Uh, that sort of thing regularly changes, although over a very long time. You could say it's some homeostasis, but only, these are only for a short time. And third thing that's changed is the arrival of computation. And this is really what I want to talk about. It's the arrival of a world that's opened up by the computer. I call this arbitrarily, I call it Turing's world. I could have called it many other things. It's not von Neumann's world, but it's very much Turing's world because Turing was the very first person to formalize the idea of what he called a method, what we would now call an algorithm, and what computation was all about. And what I want to talk about here is how does Turing's world work? What does it show us? And what, in particular, it says about how science is done. And this is what's fascinating me. I've written a paper about this, that we shifted, in the 1600s, we shifted from expressing science in terms of geometry to expressing it by 1720 in terms of algebra or equations. Now, I believe, and by the way, geometry never disappeared. The equations just layered on top. Now we're shifting from just having equations and geometry to another layer, and that is a layer of algorithms that describe the scientific world. So when I say algorithms, I'm not talking about Google search or Facebook. I'm talking about uh, a mode of expression, a new language of expression that has to do with algorithms. In fact, <clears throat> I was looking at two books of mine, they're both collections of papers, and I thought, I've degenerated over the last 20 years. The first book I produced is full of um, standard mathematics, algebra. I'm trained mostly as a mathematician. And uh, I thought 20 or 30 years later, the second collection of papers, just seems to have algorithms in it. And I thought, well, lazy bugger or whatever you want to say. I, have I forgotten how to do mathematics? No, I think mathematics has shifted. So let me see how we can work that out. Algorithms are also used. We, we can explore things algorithmically. We can explore the world al algorithmically. You can explore the world with equations, and before that, you could explore it with geometry. And by the way, there was a huge resistance to equations when they came. Isaac Newton said that <laughs> algebra was an analysis for bunglers in mathematics. Uh, it didn't stop him using <laughs> it, of course, but he brought out his book in 1687 as geometry. You could have said maybe English was a language for bunglers too, because he brought it out in Latin. Uh, and many, many. Uh, Kepler just said flatly, oh, algebra is gauche. Algebra belonged to traders. So I'm not expecting you to just sort of open your arms and say, oh, well, we have new language to layer on top uh, algorithms. But let, let me ask what this does. What I want to go to is to say, what do algorithms supply? I'm talking about real algorithms, not, not simply commercial ones. So let me start with equations. There's a famous set of equations you might recognize. <clears throat> the Lorentz equations, Ed Lorentz, from the 1960s, have to do 
He was at MIT. This has to do with atmosphere and weather. I don't know what the X, Y, and Z are. The probably um, pressure, humidity, etc. So this has to do with how the weather unfolds. Um, and I want you to notice this is just a simple first order set. Differential equations are non-linear. There's an x is multiplied by the z, etc. But the important thing about equations that I want to illustrate with this is that if you know x and y and, and z as quantities, if you know exactly what those variables are, you will know exactly what direction you're going in. There's a way to see this, this back to geometry, <laughs> pre-1720. <laughs> This is the manifold or the set of directions for Lorentz's equations. So in x, y, z space, three dimensions, if I know I'm precisely here, I would follow these threads and know, oh, I'm going in this direction. So with equations, where you go next is determined exactly by where you now are, plus, of course, this nonlinear rule. Now, this is the amazing thing in, in 1720, so it's 2020 and 300 years worth, is this has given us so much science. And I'm equation-based, my entire training, my expertise for quite a long time was nonlinear, stochastic uh, dynamics, and... Um, but this sort of thing has served us immensely well. So I'm not arguing this is wrong. I'm not even arguing that it's particularly deficient. I want to argue something you can place on top. What can we say about algorithms? They widen things up. So here's, this looks very innocent. It's obviously an algorithm. I just took it off Google Images by algorithm, no doubt. And notice the if then. If do something, if that's true, then do this. If it isn't true, that's the else, and this is true, then do something else again. So what algorithms are able to do is to include conditions. Typically algorithms are full of equations, not always, but quite often or nearly always, they're full of equations. And so you can think of algorithmic systems at as equations with conditional rules. Equations with conditional updating, what does that do? Where you go next with an algorithm depends, of course, on where you are, that is where the computation is, what the variable values are, but it also depends on the context. The if-then could be measuring if uh, this variable has reached this value and that variable is, has not reached that value and some other variable has reached this value, <laughs> then execute this. If that's not true, then execute something else. So we have immediately, I'm calling this the context, we immediately have um, a set of conditions. And algorithms are not just going sort of like a luge downhill in, the, in, in this other space. They are giving you, they're looking to their environment, and they're saying, if this is true, do that. Algorithms, the conditions of the context, can include whether a set of switches is open or closed, or some very complicated Boolean set of conditions, they can include, say, if this algorithm is in an aircraft, what the angle of attack is, what the current pressure is outside, what the airspeed is, and readjust or do things accordingly. You can do that with equations to quite some degree, but algorithms, you can do it in general. You can throw in anything you want. I could uh, redo this and add another if condition, if the price of tea in China is such and such, then do that. Notice, and this is where we are in Yanni territory, 
where you were talking about the cell reacts to its inner circumstances and to its outer circumstances. An algorithm where you're going next, or what you're executing next, where the whole computation is heading, can react to its inner context. What, where is the computation now? What are all the variables in the computation doing? Or it can react to its outer environment. So that immediately sets up the suspicion that we are in, <laughs> I don't know what I would call it, <laughs> Hofmeier land or whatever, but there must be something to do here with uh, complexity. Let me come to that in a moment, because here's the power of algorithms, is that the context, an algorithm can sense both its inside context, it's where it is in the computation, it can sense anything you want to throw in the outer environment, and it can react to this it can show an intelligent response. Equations can do that too, uh, but it's, you have to write all that in uh, to the equations, etc. And it's much harder to do with equations. Algorithms give us something like the interior of a cell that are reacting to what's going on arbitrarily, and you can throw in new things, and they will react. And so what you get from algorithms is an intelligent response to their current context. This is probably in Palo Alto. We have driverless cars. You're driving up and down El Camino Real, where I live. And <laughs> you're never quite sure the car in front of you has a driver in it or not. Uh, this is how a Google car, we used to call them Google cars. Now they're called Waymo. And this is what it's seeing. It's seeing these pixels, it's seeing those pixels. It says, if this is a human being, and the human being is traveling in this direction, steer left a bit. If that's a poster of a human being, or, or that is a stationary car, then do something else. So algorithms are allowing you, for one thing, to model the whole idea of intelligent response. They're doing another thing. Oh, the connection of complexity is that uh, what I'm saying is that how algorithms move or update themselves allows systems that they're in to react to the context they create. Get rid of the McAfee nonsense. It always shows up in there. Okay. Sorry. Ooh, that, that did it. McAfee's always protected. Just a second. <laughs> All right. Hope this gets it back. Okay. So uh, algorithms are uh, uh, an algorithm updates what it's doing uh, depending on the context uh, it is not just in, but as an algorithm shifts and moves, it's creating that context. But a complex system complexity studies systems that react, that create a context or a pattern that they are reacting to. <laughs> so the first thing that would occur to me is that these things are much the same, that many algorithms, in fact most algorithms, can be viewed as complex systems, and most complex systems can be used as algorithms. And I hasten to say this doesn't rule out math standard algebraic mathematics in complexity, it just says that there's a natural language for complexity that has to do with algorithms. And in fact, I would, someone asked me one time, how would I define uh, complexity? A guy from Scientific American. I, I said, complexity is what happens when Darwin gets a computer. It, complexity studies systems that react to the context they create. But so do algorithms. Second thing algorithms do, and that is uh, we can model processes using algorithms. If, you, if we've done this, if we've done this, if we've done this, if we've done this, then start doing this and this and this. So suddenly you're in a, 
an event triggering event type of situation, you can model that and you can, therefore you can model processes and uh, there's a footnote here, that's the way life works. Biological systems work in terms of things or events triggering further events or inhibiting further events. Here's an example. I took this from a genetic regulatory <coughs> network. It's basically the network of gene expression for some type of flower. <coughs> and the petals may open or the flower may bud or whatever, depending if this and that and that are switched on, these proteins are getting expressed, then express the other, these other proteins or inhibit those proteins, and that's the way the flower works. What I want to point out about this is this is profoundly algorithmic. You could write this with zero and one type of equations. It would be cumbersome, but you can certainly write it, in fact, uh, it's pictured here as an algorithm, or this is a map for a set of algorithms. So just to summarize what I said, algorithmic expression gives us a wider set of systems, ones that are context-dependent and event-driven equations. And this is really, I think, the most important thing. I thought this was trivial when I thought of it, but I'm realizing this is more and more important. Equations deal with quantities. So if you have um, acceleration is, what is it, F equals MA, sorry, <laughs> force equals mass by acceleration. Notice those are quantities. There are amounts of acceleration. There are amounts of force. There are amounts of mass of mass, and when you write any equation, you're basically having to relate quantities to quantities. Or you're showing a relationship between this, that, and the other set of quantities. Could be nonlinear. But these quantities and that amount, that, that the values for those quantities, are telling you what happens next. Or if nothing happens, they're expressing some relationship or balance. That means if you want to use standard algebra, you need to reduce everything you're talking about to quantities, to nouns. It could be position, it could be time, it could be chemical reaction levels. But these are all nouns. And that means that when economics was trying to get itself going as a more formal science in the 1870s, and as Jean said, <laughs> it's copying physics. Uh, economics decided it was only going to, unconsciously, it started to deal with nouns. So in economics, you have rates of exchange, you have amounts traded, you have quantities produced, quantities consumed, you have number of firms. These are all nouns. Algorithms allow you to deal with quantities as well, but also actions or processes. So they allow verb-based or procedural sciences. And this then starts to, if you recognize that biology is largely procedural or verb-based, this switches this on, this triggers that, that triggers this, this inhibits that, then you begin to see that biology could indeed be expressed as algorithms. In the exploration side, uh, I want to ask if I take an algorithmic experimental setup, what does that say about the four pillars of science, predictability, and so on? I'll go through this pretty fast. This is a photograph, I think, not very clear one, of a log jam on a Canadian river. And you could easily it would be very difficult to set this up as a set of algebraic equations. You could do it in principle, but the whole thing is rather too complicated. And if another log is floating down the river, what's going to happen? It, it's difficult. Could you set it up algorithmically? You bet. And it's not that hard, because you're just dealing with the next log to float down the river. And that is forming something with the previous pattern that's been created. Uh, 
So patterns are, the outcome is ordered, as you can see, but it's complicated. <coughs> it's in Prigogine territory, it's open, meaning that the pattern is quite ordered, somewhat, un certainly unpredictable, and somewhat uh, unordered, uh, and it's open to different things happening next. Here's another system that you could, you could write equations easily for this, uh, you, but you certainly could write an algorithm. How did this system, river basin like this form? That, by the way, is the Cooper River. It's in South Carolina in America. And that, believe it or not, I realized, is not computer generated. This is a um, picture from an airplane, aeroplane window, because there's the sun glinting off this. You could easily write an algorithm that shows how a system like this can gouge out uh, pathways. I would say it's organic in the sense that it's, sort of, it's mechanistic, all right, but it's organic in the sense that it's showing you patterns, or patterns that are highly interrelated, where the next organ or the next branch uh, is depending on what went before. Another one, Stephen Wolfram, who is a very bright guy, uh, self-confessed, of course, <laughs> um, my, my comment on Wolfram is just because he says he's the smartest guy in the world doesn't mean he's not. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, uh, if you know about cellular automata, they're basically very simple mathematical rules that show you if I have this line of pixels, some of which are black, some people's pixels are white. Uh, for the next pixel, time is moving in this direction, so for the next pixel, it's reacting to where these are, whether this little pattern ahead of it is black or white. If you don't know anything about cellular automata, don't worry. They date back to Los Alamos, to von Neumann, and uh, Ulam. This looks really lovely. It's a very simple rule. You can write it algorithmically. You can even write it in terms of 0, 1 types of equations. And it's predictable. If you gave me that or I gave you that and said, tell me what the pattern is going to be at time 1 billion and 1, uh, you could sit down and it might take you an hour or two. <laughs> but you could work it out because it's highly ordered. You can see a repeat pattern, etc. What Wolfram found, and I think this is just staggering, Wolfram discovered, and you may know about this, that many simple equations, or if you like, uh, systems like this that are algorithmic and sufficiently simple produce predictable patterns. But many don't. Starting, you know, Starting here, this pattern dies out. Starting there, it dies out, and so on. What Wolfram discovered was that you, for most simple nonlinear systems, you, there's no shorter way to predict where it's going to go than to compute that. If I said what's going to happen at step 1 billion and 1, there are theorems by Greg Chaitin. And there's demonstrations by Wolfram saying there's no shorter way to predict that than just to step through a billion and one steps of this algorithm. Similarly, with algorithmic systems in general, they don't lead to stasis or equilibrium. Stasis or equilibrium are extraordinarily special cases. As we just saw, there's nothing equilibrium about this. When I was trained in economics, the whole idea was that everything you're looking at is an equilibrium in principle, and over in the corner in a set of measures here are exceptions. And I sort of thought, hmm, not sure. Certainly that's not true uh, politically. 
now we're seeing that nearly everything in principle is highly uh, disordered, not predictable, but there's a small set of interesting things that are predictable and lead to stasis or harmony. I want to finish up with a quote uh, from Edsgar Dijkstra, a um, Dutch uh, computer scientist in the 1970s, since died. And he, brilliant, brilliant systems theorist. He said, here, this is an offhand remark, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. The galaxies and the universe existed and was amazing and wonderful and incredible long before Galileo made his telescope around 1610. And Dijkstra's idea is that this Turing's world, he wouldn't have called that, I'm sure, Dijkstra's world or whatever it is, is just a stag, the world that algorithms can create, the world that algorithms can reveal, is amazing. We use computers to explore that world, just as we've used equations to explore the physical world or the economic world or the biological world. But this is giving us a completely different set of techniques. Uh, Greg Chaitin, Argentinian uh, mathematician, and uh, <laughs> I have to tell you the story. I'm up in the Arctic. It's northern Sweden. It's in May. I said to Greg, uh, I said, what do you think happens to the sun? Uh, there was no night. This was in May above the Arctic Circle. I said, what happens to the sun as it goes round? Greg says to me, he says, I don't know. He said, it's a long time since I studied projective geometry. I got every up, engineer, I got up every two hours and looked and goes around and numbers. But anyway, Greg is super, super, super bright. He has developed something called algorithmic information theory, and I will encapsulate that by just telling you Greg's idea, the whole idea of algorithmic information theory, I don't think he'd object, is to say that if you take an acorn, built into that acorn, or chemically speaking, or the initial conditions, the input data, and an algorithm by which it's going to flower into a, an oak tree, presumably. And you need outside soil, as we were told. You need outside conditions. And you could view an acorn, therefore, as some initial data plus algorithm. And as you allow the acorn to compute itself out, it gives you an oak tree. And so what... This is very much algorithmic thinking. Greg would say that if you start with an algorithm and you apply computation to it, you allow something to compute it out, you get output. So he would look at the algorithm as being an element of mathematics. The input data is certainly an element of mathematics. That's a structure in mathematics. This is an operation on the structure. So allowing the acorn to compute itself out gives you the oak tree. These are all entities in a new form of mathematics. Greg uh, just simply uh, said a very couple of beautiful books on this. The computer is a revolutionary new kind of mathematics. He doesn't say the computer is like mathematics. This is an operation. He doesn't say anything about this is, enables us to do with mathematics. The computer, or if you like, algorithms, or computing something that is a new kind of mathematics, mathematical operation, with profound philosophical consequences. It reveals a new world. What world? The one that Dijkstra is pointing to. Let me finish here and, oh, I, uh, hang on. 
I have got one other person. I'm very fond of indeed, and I'll give him the last word. This is Robert Johnson, who died last September. Uh, lived in California, came originally from Oregon, and was trained by, um, as a Jungian therapist, Jungian psychologist, by Mrs. Jung <laughs> in Zurich, uh, also knew Carl Jung. So he's trained at the Jung Institute, died at 95 a few months ago. And I'll give him this uh, rather lovely last observation. Says, so says Robert Johnson, it seems it is the purpose of evolution now to replace the image of perfection, let me use the word order, with the concept of completeness or wholeness, I call that organicism. Perfection suggests something all pure, <clears throat> The whole idea we can axiomatize the world, we can reduce it to something that's pure concepts. With no blemishes, dark spots, or questionable areas, wholeness includes the darkness, but combines it with the light elements into a totality more real, more whole than any ideal. So we're moving from, if you like, a platonic world, where there are, to quote, um, Robert Venturi, the architect, where there are prim dreams of pure order, we're moving into a world that recognizes and embraces messy vitality. That's Jean mentioned the messiness. This is also the world um, that Venturi was talking about. This is an awesome task, says Johnson, but whether we like it or not, we're in that process. Let me summarize what I'm saying here. I believe science has shifted to becoming not just geometry-based, not just equation-based as a language of expression, but also algorithm-based. Layering on top. If you're trained as a mathematician with equations, fear ye not, you'll be fine. But there's also a new form of expression in town. Algorithms allow context, very sort of context that Jan was talking about, external context, the internal context, and they allow process to be the drivers. That's why this language is powerful. And algorithms, we can look at some systems like ACORNS and say, well, that's got input data and an algorithm built in. So we can look at the world algorithmically Algorithms can be regarded as complex systems. I've been toying with an idea where I realized that a Turing machine in operation is a complex system. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the first person to observe that. I haven't checked if anyone else has said that. But there's a very strong relationship between algorithmic computation, if you like, and the way complex systems work themselves out. Algorithms extend what science can examine. They allow us to look at really complex systems, traffic systems, cell systems, as we just heard, etc. And if you embrace what Greg Chaitin is saying, or Wolfram, Wolfram says, this is a new kind of science. That's the title of his book. And Greg uh, Chaitin says, new kind of mathematics. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Brian, for, um, uh, for a, a lovely uh, description of, of, um, of algorithms and a really interesting um, talk. Um, what, what I was just um, thinking about and, and um, I'd love your views on this, is that algorithms can deal with known unknowns. Um, but we're, we still want to include in complex systems the idea of, of emergence of unknown unknowns. And um, I'm, I, my kind of sense is that, that you know, al algorithms um, can to some extent write themselves, but there's, there's something beyond which um, they can't go. And I, I just wondered to how you would, whether you agree with that comment. Yeah, I do agree with uh, what you're saying. 
Um, I think I'm certainly not saying that algorithms can describe all that is out there. And if you take this DAO world that you're conversant with, uh, it points out that there are worlds of infinite worlds far beyond anything we can imagine. Algorithms, I think, can only describe things that we have some idea about. And I, but like equations, I think they're opening up a different understanding. Uh, you know, this bullying that was going on in the 1680s or 1660s saying, you know, equations should be stopped. Why? Because if the world, if the world in those days, people believe the world was created by God, uh, it was created to be orderly. Orderly meant it was geometric, therefore, and I'm quoting um, Kepler and Galileo, who both said geometry is the mind of God. Well, we know it's not. Equations have shown it, and algorithms show you other things. 